Salutations, everyone. Welcome back to Total Warhammer 3. I'm Lord Foreman, and we've got another Empire video. This is part of the larger Empire playlist of guides, as well as the Total Warhammer guide series I've been doing. Today, we're going to talk about Elsbeth von Draken of Wissenlin and Nuln, which has to be one of the worst names for a faction in this. I prefer the power of Nuln. Anyhow, this is the new one. Uh, the newest the newest Empire Lord introduced, and I've talked about all the various buildings and units before, so today we're just going to be going over her unique mechanics, starting location, um, units, buildings, mechanics, etc. So, uh, if you enjoy this, do like, comment, subscribe, as well as check out the other videos in the playlist, and hopefully you enjoy this. So let's get started. The first thing to know about Elspeth von Draken's start is the per first thing you probably want to want to do is hit the home key on your keyboard um, and actually realign the map a bit to your home base or use your W or E key to get the view pointed north. So for some reason, the Total War games always start your camera oddly aligned. I prefer straight up. Anyhow. Here we are, we're in Nuln. So we have basically replaced Balthazar Gelt, for those of you who remember his start lo location down here. He's off in Cathay. We've replaced this faction here. It's an interesting start location because to the north, you're largely protected by Franz and the rest of the empire. And to the east, you're protected by the few empire settlements that will inevitably fall to the vampire counts, which means you actually have a fair amount of time to build up and get powerful before you expand. Now, Elizabeth Von Draken has several unique mechanics, so we'll start with the basic one or two of them. So the first one is she has access to the Imperial Gunnery School, and we'll go over this again later. Suffice to say, she has these schematics that she gets from buildings, field testing, which is fighting in battle, other as well as post-battle options, she spends these to upgrade the gunnery units. And these can be fairly substantial. For example, the Hellstorm rocket battery one gets additional projectiles as well as ammunition. Three additional projectiles on the Hellstorm rocket battery is very powerful. Thankfully, it tells you exactly which unit it affects. And right here, you can see additional infantry strengths for gunnery units is really good for the Empire. I think at the moment, Elsbeth von Draken is probably the strongest of the Empire factions. I'm sure there's someone who'll disagree with me, but I think she's the strongest with these mechanics. Any faction that gets unique upgrades to already powerful units is going to be one of the best. Now, additionally, once you unlock Tier 2, you get access to the Amethyst Armory. We'll talk about that later, assuming I remember. But the way you do that is you complete these tier requirements. So here they are. Some people have been complaining they can't find them, so I figured it was worth the mention. Have three handgunners, construct the Firearm Academy, the level 2 missile range, as well as get three upgrades. By that, it means three of these on the units. Afterwards, you also get rewards, then you unlock new stuff, including experimental explosives ancillary, which is kind of cool because you can actually get like unique weapons for your engineer heroes and stuff. So that's one of her unique mechanics. So we'll just, I'm going to go over the start now and then we'll talk about her other ones. Actually, before we do that, let's talk about Imperial Authority. So Elsbeth has access to Imperial Authority along with Franz and Gelt if he returns to the Empire. Basically, as the number of Empire lands that are owned by the Empire goes up or down, you get various bonuses. At the start of the game, you're stagnant. It will very, very quickly fall, in my experience, down to decline or even to the nation crumbles. This could be a problem for growth and control, meaning as the Empire gets worse, you will grow slower. This forces Elsbeth, in particular, Franz is going to be overwhelmed early on with fighting wars, forces Elsbeth to leave her very stagnant build-up playstyle and actually push into the rest of the Empire to help. She has some mechanics, and we'll go over those later, but the biggest threat to the Imperial Authority for Elsbeth is the vampires. So at the start of the game, you're here in Nuln, and you're at war with this minor court of night of the vampire counts 
don't worry about them. They're not anything special. You start off with an engineer hero. You want to stick that in Elspeth army. Gives increased mobility, which is quite nice to have it at the start. 10% movement rain will come in handy. Elsbeth herself is a very powerful hero. First off, she's immune to vampiric attrition, which makes her perfect to fight the vampire counts. She gets a cooldown on Lore of Death, which is decent. Uh, Lore of Death has some very powerful stuff. She has this unique ability called Dark Walker. She gets huge amounts of physical resistance, as well as Strider, meaning she crosses all terrain equally fast. This is good early on, kind of falls off when she gets her dragon mount and flies through the air. Okay. It has some unique other stuff later on, and she can upgrade it. So she has the very standard blue line. You're going to want to go down the tree to you get Logician and probably Headhunter here so that your army replenishes and is, is um, overall buffed and cheaper. Getting Quartermaster can help with money problems. Later on, you're going to want to go down her unique yellow line here. Radiance, healing cap for enemy armies is perfect for fighting the vampires. Blessed by Shaith decreases the cost for lore of death you're going to want to cast a lot of death spells as her advisor of known is less useful until you start having lots of gunnery units but once you do you get really cheap gunnery units and they're really really good the dark lady i particularly like it does decrease the cooldown on dark water but more importantly it adds living darkness which continually Gives her 10% physical resistance to an ally nearby, as well as negates magical weapons for the enemies. This can be very useful if you're fighting factions that use magical weapons to get through your character's armor. Um, overall, though, it's just a really nice buff to melee physical resistance to one of your... By and large, you're probably going to be one of, one of your frontline infantry units. The Graveyard Rose is quite nice. Again, more casualty replenishment. If you watch my other videos, you know I'm a fan of casualty replenishment, right? Womb Time combined with Irrepressible means she's basically back every two or one or two turns. As well as she gets regeneration, which is nice. Of course, she's not a great fighter. So if you're taking a lot of damage and need to replenish, you might want to move her out of combat. Her final one here is really handy. Magic... Magisterics of the Amethyst Order uh, makes your Purple Son of Xerxes really cheap. As in, she can she can pretty well spam this spell, and it does a lot of damage. It's a very powerful spell to begin with, and she just makes it even cheaper and stronger. As the game goes on, she'll get a Warhorse, then a Dragon. She will get a Frostfire Gem, which is quite interesting. If you look at it, you can give flaming attacks to a Lord or Hero as well as Frostfire. I particularly like sticking on this on like an Empire Captain unit or even your Engineer early game to fight Vampire units. Everward Root is worth mentioning. Vigor Loss as well as Regeneration on a Lord or Hero. Put this on the Empire Captain, give him the Frostfire Gem, and he will massacre Vampire units like they're going out of style. Doom Firing is quite nice as well. Fire resistance as well as burning head to a Lord of Hero. I tend to leave this on Elspeth herself, and it gives her basically an extra spell casting ability. You theoretically could toss it on another Lord of Hero and then cast the spell from them, but really, why bother? Uh, she has access to Hold the Line, which you should snag in like your first five or six level ups. Giving a buff to melee defense and leadership to all the allies nearby is worth it. If you've got an Empire Captain with this ability, not as important for her, but you won't. And she has the standard spell resistance and mentor stuff. Everything else about her is fairly normal. She has the standard tree for a lore of death mage. Um, it's good. Purple Son of Xerxes in particular is a really powerful spell. Um, her Red line here, I don't recommend rushing down it that quickly, but once you get going, you're going to want to go Inspiring Presence, Empire's Finest. If you do that, her infantry units, just like all the other Empire Lords, because this is standard to them, becomes very powerful. The Halberdiers over here are particularly hard to kill with an additional fully buffed 6 defense and attack. You want this, especially because as Elsbeth, you're going to be fighting the vampires. 
which love melee combat, so buffing your melee units so that they don't die as fast will be very handy. Afterwards, Imperial Gunnery is particularly useful for her, as well as Mighty Forge, because you're going to have War Machines and Artillery galore as Wissenland Nulm. Outside of that, make sure you snag either Artillery Mastery or my personal favorite, Strength of Hardship. Basically, this will make your infantry superior to most any AI army you would fight. Obviously, versus player armies, all bets are off. She's got your standard quests. They're fairly nice. I like Death's Timekeeper because it gives you magic every turn, which is handy. Death's Timekeeper here allows for healing and weakening of enemies. Honestly, her Pale Scythe is okay. She gets more spell resistance and spell mastery when allies or enemies cast spells. That's about it, as well as a little bit better in melee combat. She flies above the battle, drops Purple Sun of Xerxes on everybody, and she wins. So, the first thing you're going to want to do as her, as for actual moves, is combine the Engineer with it. March out, win this battle. Then you're going to want to take this settlement. You can do that in your first turn, and it's worth doing. Then, in terms of recruitments, you've got some choices here. So this does not give you any additional units, and you do start with a level 1 shooting range, which is nice for her faction. I recommend training a Spearman. Depends what you're interested in. I particularly like the Free Company Militia at the beginning because you're fighting vampiric units, which are slow <coughs> and have no range. Pistoliers won't kill them fast enough, nor will archers. At least with Free Company, they can fight as well. Sadly, Spearmen are extremely useless units. And you also have a choice for her. So you can't get your unique landmark units. You can, and I'm a big fan of building the barracks in this settlement to begin with. This will give you access to the better melee units so you don't so you're not stuck with spearmen. Thankfully, you can get spearmen with shields and swordsmen in one turn. Your other option, and it's up to you. I don't recommend doing this, though. You could build basic walls immediately. The reason you might want to do this is so that you don't lose your capital to a random marauding army or a snipe by the vampire counts. Honestly, right now in the game, Nuln, fully upgraded with garrison buildings and its landmarks, I think is the single strongest defensive settlement in the game. I want to repeat that. Single strongest defensive settlement in the game. I have not found that the enemy could take it even with three fully upgraded late game dwarf armies it is very powerful known itself here has these known cannon foundries which upgraded give you gunners mortars great cannons and volley guns it's kind of ridiculous the black rose chapter house gives you knights of the black rose so right there that's two five seven nine ten units on top of the already very strong Empire Garrison, as well as the Settlement Building. You're going to have like 25 Garrison units. It's unbelievable. Anyway, I'm di I am digress. After you do that, build up your army. If you build the barracks, you may consider taking another turn. But I would recommend marching out and taking Wissenberg pretty quickly. Now, if you haven't built the Garrison Building in your capital which to some degree I recommend doing, you will get another garrison building here and get access to the better infantry. The problem is it's a minor settlement and the AI loves raiding and taking your minor settlements. And if you lose them, then you can't train better infantry for quite some time because you're only going to have a handful of settlements at that point. Specifically against the vampire counts, they love taking the settlement I found. It's like they're obsessed with it. It's almost as bad as Kemper bad. Um, so if you don't get the better infantry units, what you'd want to do for the first turn is either garrison or money. Money can be a bit of a problem early game for the empire, so that will help. Once you've taken the settlement, build up. The siege of Pfeildorf here, or Fieldorf, is going to take a while. I find the amp in the four or five test runs I've done, the empire cannot take this settlement quickly. The vampires will reinforce. I tended to lose most of my army taking it. It was worth it, however. Once you destroy that, the Court of Night is gone. And that gives you control of the whole area down here. The next things to do is take the fort down here, 
which may or may not be owned by a hostile faction to you. Sometimes it seems to be, sometimes it doesn't, as Wills wander over here and take Steingart, eliminating this very minor greenskin settlement if they haven't. At which point you have two regions, you should have a full stack, you should be in a very good spot, and you will have access to some of the other mechanics. So we'll just talk briefly here, and then I'm going to jump later to show you the other mechanics. Afterwards, you have a couple choices for expansion. You could go south and get involved in the border counts, the border princes. I don't recommend you do so. By the time you take this whole area, cement, and rebuild your armies and stuff, your empire authority will probably dec be declining drastically. Because right now, this is the situation at the start of the game. In my experience, Hawkland is mostly destroyed. Middenheim is usually pushed back to one of its settlements. The less said about what's going on in Marienburg, the better, but they usually use the, lose these northern settlements up here. Ostland is usually on its knees. Tebeckland actually holds out for a while right now. Ostermark over here is usually being killed by the Wargrove of Woe, as well as Sterling has usually, by the time you take Pfildorf here, lost its capital to the Vampire Counts. Thankfully, down here, Averland holds out for a while longer, and to a some degree, you can kind of ignore this region. Now, I find the ogres will sometimes invade. If they take Grenstadt here, they tend to declare war on you and take Steingart over and over and over and over again. At which point, you may want to declare war, kick the ogres out, be warned, though, they will be back in like five or six turns. And at some point, you or the dwarves will have to wipe them out over here. Afterwards, though, you're probably going to want to turn your attention north to the vampire counts. In my games, they, they controlled most of this area by the time I was in a good position. And I did it on very hard and legendary to test it all. They usually only expand so far so quickly. But your empire authority will be negative and getting worse, at which point you definitely want to fight and drive them back. Thankfully, you're immune to vampire corruption, which makes pushing them out significantly easier. My best strategy I came up with was to take Wurt Bag and hold it until I had a second army, at which point I just sent Elsbeth on a rampage pretty much straight to Castle Drakenhof and took it. Once you take Drakenhof, the vampire counts kind of collapse. It's their big source of both money and troops. They were still alive up here, and it would take me another 30 or 40 turns to eliminate in that campaign, but they were never a threat. Once you take a couple of these settlements, even if you just sack them and leave, they are significantly weakened, and honestly, Elsbeth is perfect for that because of the immunity to corruption. Your other army should probably sit in Wurtbad with a wall garrison building and just slaughter all the vampires that come to them. The Empire particularly loves Needling, Krugenheim, Kemperbad, and Wissenberg, I find. If you own Krugenheim and Needling, the enemy will almost always raid and sack them, and sometimes enemies will declare on war just to sack the settlement. So this might be a settlement not necessarily to take. A strategy I particularly liked was taking a couple of these and then selling them back to the Elector Counts or to Franz for immense amounts of money to fund my war machine to take this area. Once you take this area, Drakenhof becomes your new center of recruitment and wealth, and my your attention would focus over there. However, let's jump forward in time so you can see some of the other mechanics and unique units. Okay, here we are 103 turns into the game. So this is what my world looked like at this point. I think this was my very hard game, but it could be one of my harder ones. Anyway, uh, one thing I also should mention is the mountains here. To you are unpleasant climates, so early on I would not recommend taking them. I recommend selling them to the dwarves, who particularly loved the land and gave me like 15,000 for this settlement several times. Anyway, the unique other mechanics Elsbeth looks at. So the one that really deserves mention is this random floating purple rose. This is her access to the Gardens of Moor, and it explains what they do. Basically, you can pick five neutral or friendly Empire settlements and construct a Garden of Moor there. Then Elizabeth and her army can instantly fast travel, there is a cooldown, to them. Now, the Empire of Gardens of Moor, and they don't really mention this, gives you very 
useful buildings in those territories. And so where you put them early on matters. So let's look at Altdorf to start. And by the way, if you wanted to destroy them, um, there is a way to do so. Um, let me see. Right here, if you click on the center, you can then deconstruct them. That's important because I didn't figure out how to do that for quite a while. Also, this is where you click to fast travel. Now, the build, I think, is a three or four turn cooldown, and it's a significant chunk of cash to build it and then to teleport there. But if we look at Altdorf, I'll explain again why Nuln itself is one of the powerful ones. And the reason I'm doing Altdorf is so you can see it's not just unique to her capital. First off, you'll get a black tower. It'll give halberdiers as well as reduce the fast travel cost for elspeth if she's in the region which is kind of odd it allows you to fast travel there you become immune to diplomatic penalties for trespassing which the idea is that you could teleport around the empire defending it don't think of it that way think of it in terms of using it to jump across your empire faster not worrying about defending the minor empire counts because they're going to get destroyed or swallowed up by friends before you get going however it does enable replenishment in foreign territory enemies and local and adjacent regions very handy if you're defending um, franz or one of the other lords for some reason the increased garrison is nice. Now, you will have access to three different buildings, out of which two are clearly the clear choices. Let's go with the one that isn't first. So, the Amethyst College gives you access to the Amethyst Lore of Death Wizards, adds the capacity to them, increases faction-wide power reserve, as well as gives wind of power reserve per turn to the armies in the region. Very useful for Elspeth on defense. If you want a lot of battle wizards, great. The reality is you really only need one amethyst wizard and army. More than one is not really worth it. Um, just because you usually the cooldowns are short enough that you can keep casting. Now, the next one here is the Temple of Moor. This one bears some special mention because it unlocks the Knights of Moor Elector Count State Troops. The Elector Count State Troops are very useful. Um, we will talk again briefly about them later on but it speeds up their recruitment times and it gives you access to a unit you can recruit anywhere instantly fairly early on in the game reduces corruptions and reduces vigor loss while fighting undead this would seem like you want to put it on the front lines of the vampire count war you really don't in my opinion you want to put the last one which right at the moment is the clear winner I suspect this will be nerfed and the others will be buffed because this is ridiculous. So first off, on the bottom, it gives a four-unit garrison on top of the two that building the garden gives you already. That's six additional garrison units to that settlement. You put that in an empire capital settlement, that defender is going to actually struggle to lose that settlement to roaming armies, especially if it has a garrison building or is Altdorf, which is nice because you can ensure they're safe. Going up, it gives a recruitment to your global recruitment capacity. If you've watched some of my other stuff, you know that the Empire really uses global recruitment powerfully later on. It also reduces global recruitment in the region by up to two, which is amazing, meaning you recruit globally in that region almost instantly. And the totally broken negative 25% upkeeps for all armies in local and adjacent regions. This is ridiculous, especially early on. Basically, anywhere you're fighting and you have lots of armies, you should have one of those settlements. So early on, my recommendation is in Nome, throw down the decreased upkeep, garrisons, and everything else, as well as a tower in your own settlement. Now, why that matters, this is the garrison that anyone's approaching in Nome, and this settlement is still not entirely... Um, well, it is actually entirely built up. It's a very powerful 20-unit garrison. I don't think it can be taken by any random roaming armies. It's ridiculously good. Um, it's my argument for why that settlement is almost untakeable. Um, 20 gate units garrison plus whatever units you have standing there to decrease cost. It's ridiculous. I think strongest settlement in the game right now. Anyhow. My recommendation is early on, you throw one of those down in Nuln. It'll give you the garrison, and more importantly, it'll give you the decreased cost in a huge area. 
So it will cover this area, cover this area, cover this area, and cover this area. That's a huge amount of territory to have 25% decreased cost in, especially while you're fighting vampires. It also will give you the recruitment speed as well as the replenishment. It's really a ridiculously good building to throw there. It gets even more ridiculous if the enemy th or your ally puts a garrison in there just to make things worse. <laughs> the settlement is really powerful. Anyhow, that is a mechanic you're going to want to use. You're going to want to throw it everywhere. Now, the unique thing is you can throw it on other continents. So, for example, if we look all the way over here, and for some reason, if we wanted to, we could teleport all the way over here and help Balthazar Gelt in Cathay. If for some reason we don't want to play anymore in the Empire. The reality is the Empire is going to keep you busy for the whole game. Um, it's kind of weird you can teleport, but it's nice. Especially, I played this another 200 turns. Um, it was very useful for shuffling my armies around the map. Specifically Elsbeth, because she's so powerful. Everyone else I just disbanded and rebuilt elsewhere. So as you can see, we've thrown a couple. Obviously, one's in Altdorf to protect my ally and the Emperor. One's in Nuln, so I get the insane garrison and cheapness. Once I took Templehof, I could have thrown this in Drakenhof. I chose Templehof as it particularly for a reason. If we zoom out, Northern Sylvania hits all this area, which is really nice. Southern Sylvania hits land that we've already covered two ways and covers the Dwarven settlements, which we don't need to. A better might actually be Ostermark, because then we would get all of this area. Tebekland also would be very powerful. So just think of where you put them. Don't be afraid to shuffle them around. Once you get going, you're so rich. Um, I mean, this is what I own. This is totally useless, and I'm making 20k a turn with, I think, th four or five armies built up. Well, three armies. Anyway, it's really easy. Now, the other mechanic that we talked about earlier briefly was the Imperial Gunnery School. Now, obviously, we've upgraded to level 3 here, and so now we have access to the Amethyst Armory. So the Amethyst Armory is kind of unique. Um, obviously, it's unique to her, but in terms of game mechanic, it's very different. Over here, you have the Amethyst Artillery, where for a cost of schematics, and by the way, the only building I've found that gives you schematics only gives you like 50. So you're going to get it mainly through battles. Uh, allows you to build up charges. This one's a bombardment. Uh, well, actually, we can't see. Look, there we are. We can't see it. A bigger bombardment. And then finally, over here, a super massive bombardment. Very powerful, very useful. Basically, think Skaven Nuke to some degree. Um, quite useful in the sense that you can get more of them faster than the Skavens can get Doom Rockets. The downside is the sheer cost in schematics. But if you're fighting late game tide armies, unbelievably useful. Now, the other thing it does is unlocks these four units. And obviously these two have not yet been unlocked. They get unlocked as we go along. The first one it unlocks is Amethyst Ironsides. So you have normally known Ironsides. Amethyst Ironsides are better. Um, they're quite powerful. They're very useful. Now, the important thing to note is they have their own unique upgrades on top of the upgrades they get over here from the gunnery infantry. So double upgrades. They may get better at fighter. They get this unique soul blight, which I've only seen here, reduced damage in armor against the enemies. So basically they can tie up the enemies as well as this iron resolve, meaning you basically get Slayer Gunners, which is really strange. They won't die until they lose over 50% of hit points, meaning in terms of range battles, if these guys can hit them and they can shoot them so they're not shooting through their own guys, these guys will win range combats. Uh, very useful. The next version, Amethyst Outriders, similar. They get other unique bonuses, specifically some of these like stock and unspottable. Unspot it's kind of crazy. Um... Imagine outriders that are hard to find that can suddenly ride up, ride up and hit you with like powerful shots. It's quite fun to use. Later on, obviously, you can upgrade these. We I don't have them unlocked in this save. Now, the problem is you have to pay per unit you recruit. So again, a huge cost of schematics. Losing amethyst units really hurt. Every army can only have five, though. 
So that is a bit tricky. Now to upgrade, you do need three of them. So your first schematics at this level should go into getting Amethyst Ironsides and you will get some schematics back. So just be aware of that one. And then you have to kill more and more. So once you unlock this, you want to start using Amethyst Armory, armory units almost immediately. They're very powerful. They're very useful. The fact that you get all these upgrades for them is insane. Combined with the Gardens of Moor, combined with Elsbeth's unique stuff, I mean, here's one of my armies. We're running around with level 7 units, 65 defense. As you see, we've got Ulrika, we've got Theodora Bruckner, we've got the starting engineer and stuff. We haven't lost anything. Knight of the Black Rose, very powerful. Here's one of the Hawkland Long Rifle ones. Obviously, it's the legendary. I'm not even using the Amethyst units in this army, and it's still powerful. Uh, where did I put those, actually? Oh, here they are. This guy here. Here's what a Nuln Ironside looks like at the moment. Amazing armor, amazing leadership, good fighting, good ammunition, good range. Worth using. Amethyst guns and stuff. Very powerful. Um, it basically, if you stick Amethyst units in an army... It the army very quickly becomes equivalent to a legendary lord's army. Combined with all the other bonuses you get, so I took this, threw a tower down, now I can teleport back there when needed, and all this area has now like decreased upkeep and insane garrison. That's an example of how to use this. Um, I changed the save a bit for this guide, so this is not normally what I would be doing. Anyway, that is the example of all of that. Now, just some other minor things for Elspeth. She does have these unique buildings. You're going to want to build them. They're very powerful. She has, again, standard access to the Regiments of Renown and the Elector Count State Troops. In this point of the playthrough, I had not yet unlocked the uh, Knights of Moor or whatever. You probably want to do that earlier than I did. Just throw down a tower somewhere and build it so you get them unlocked. These are all very powerful, and the fact that you can recruit them whenever really helps Elsbeth's ability to fight against vampires. Now, oh, there's my global recruitment, by the way. It's pretty insane at the moment. Now, Elsbeth does have unique technologies. So if you've seen my technology view, you'll know that there are some unique stuff. So, she is Dark Lady of Nuln. Seeker of Knowledge, cheaper fast travel for Gardens of Moor. It's nice. Scion of the Empire is actually pretty cool. You gain vision of all non-hostile Empire capitals, which is why we can see what Gelt and Wolfheart are up to, uh, as well as this Cult of Sigmar in the desert, which means I could then teleport to them. Uh, advisor to Nuln, schematics game post-battle. In retrospect, at this point, I would have taken this earlier because I didn't realize how fast the schematic cost would rise. Amethyst armor, cheaper to buy charges as well as now. You can have eight Amethyst units in Elsbeth army. You really don't need an Elsbeth army because she's so powerful, but it's really nice if you need a late game army. Now also, you have access to these state troops. Machine of the Empire was the one I picked, and I agree that was the right choice. I very early on in the game got 7,000 gold from killing vampires. I bought this. I then kept using those mortars and steam tanks every time they came up to buy. Made fighting the vampires very easy because I now had tier 5 unit, tier five state troops and like turn 15. Um, it's worth doing. Swords of the Empire might be another one. Honestly, though, it's the it's one of the weaker ones, along with Spears of the Empire. The real weak one I hate, though, is Riders of the Empire. Just never buy this one. <laughs> really, it's, it's not worth it. Knights of the Empire is okay, especially these Knights of the Everlasting Light stuff. Um, quite useful for fighting vampires early game. Marksmen. Patrols, gunners, hand gunners, you have access to a ton of this as Elspeth already. Probably not worth it. Machines of the Empire was worth it though. And that's basically her unique stuff. More schematics, sea allied lands, faster travel, more amethyst unit, and state elector troops. Very useful to get early on, very powerful. Honestly, at this point, I should be spending every turn buying them. I think I did in my actual playthrough. So 
that is Elsbeth. I'm trying to think if we've got any other unique mechanics. I don't particularly think so. Her victory conditions are not that hard. Get Gunnery School Tier 2, kill the Vampire Council of Sylvania and the Fecundites, which is the Warriors of Chaos up here. Honestly, if you go long enough, Franz will kill them. Uh, I had to kill them myself, and then sack and loot settlements. You're going to be in the 20s just finishing off vampires and the Chaos Warriors. Afterwards, I just went north, and I just rampaged my way through Norska, and I won. No one could fight. In fact, the Norska armies, 2 versus 1, would run away from Elspeth, because it was too easy to win. I suspect she'll be nerfed. If she does, though, things will change number-wise. I can't imagine the strategy will shift much for her. And that's about it. Thank you guys all for watching this. Uh, if you can think of anything else that I missed, by all means, leave it in the comments. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Like, comment, subscribe, as well as check out the other guide videos I've done and I'm doing for the Empire and Total Warhammer 3 as well. And uh, hope to see you on another guide or let's play. Bye for now.